I would like to thank Giovanni for uh, inviting me to uh, for this opportunity to uh, share some of our recent uh, works, uh, recent results. So the title of my talk will be Enhancing Spin Orbital Efficiency by Orbital Currents. Although originally when we started this project with uh, Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Company, TSMC, uh, we didn't expect that this result can be interpreted as uh, the uh, effect from the orbital current or orbital hole effect. Uh, so original plan for this project uh, with the industry is just to enhance the efficiency of, uh, of this SOT effect. So. Here's the outline of my talk. So first of all, I'm going to have a very brief, very, very brief introduction of what's the difference between spin and orbital currents and uh, how people started from looking to uh, spin orbit coupling dominated materials to spin orbit coupling like materials or, or SOC free materials such as 3D uh, transition metals and how to utilize those kind of materials to generate spin orbit torque. That is by utilizing the orbital Rajbar Edelstein effect or the or orbital Hoy effect. And then I'll move on to some experiments that we've done uh, for the past three, uh, past few years. And uh, uh, some of the results will be coming out uh, pretty soon, um, which is by introducing chromium and vanadium, uh, those 3D transition metals into those platinum-based uh, magnetic heterostructures. And people all know that uh, uh, platinum is a, a material with strong spin hall effect or spin hall conductivity. And people typically use that to generate large SOTs. But we found that by integrating chromium and vanadium into that system, you can further enhance that uh, efficiency to a uh, very unexpected value. And then if time allows, I'll talk a little bit about how to, uh, how to integrate copper uh, into platinum-based system. Uh, instead of just uh, alloying that into platinum, maybe by using uh, like a capping layer or insertion layer, that can also uh, enhance the efficiency of the, uh, of the SOT generation. And then uh, move on to conclusion and outlook. So uh, most of the attendees here, I, I believe that uh, uh, are familiar with the spin currents and the uh, spin currents are typically generated by uh, those materials with strong spin orbit coupling. So you really rely on spin orbit coupling in the solids, either it's coming from the interface, that would be the spin Rossby Edelstein effect or from the bulk, uh, that would be the spin hole effect. For instance, in these uh, experimental demonstrations, for instance, in the silver bismuth interface, uh, you can have, when you apply a longitudinal current, then from the Rajma effect, you can generate, uh, say, the transverse uh, spin current uh, from the interfacial spin accumulation. And that would be related to the Rajma Edelstein effect. And uh, on the right-hand side, you see over here, uh, a very nice work by Emory et al. Uh, they show that uh, by using platinum or using tantalum as the buffer layer, uh, because we all know that uh, platinum and tantalum, they have opposite sides of spin hole conductivity or spin hole angle, uh, you should expect the this, this spin orbitor generated from those buffer layers will have opposite sides. And that is exactly what they found. Uh, if you uh, apply current and perform this typical spin orbitor switching, you'll see this opposite polarity. So uh, we can see uh, from these experimental results, we know that uh, either from the interface or from the bulk, you can have this kind of transverse spin current uh, while you're applying a longitudinal uh, charge current. And that uh, effect is coming from the strong spin orbit coupling in the materials. However, for the orbital currents, uh, most of the time, if you look into some theoretical literatures, they'll say that uh, the spin orbit coupling uh, is not necessary. So it means that if you look into the materials, they are not limited to those uh, strong SOC materials. So, so that's the reason why you can look into copper, uh, chromium, vanadium, those uh, 3D transition metals. And uh, the origins of such orbital current generation will also having, uh, can be categorized into two, uh, you know, uh, two parts as well. Uh, the interfacial contribution, that would be orbital Rajma Edelstein effect. And also from the bulk, uh, that will be the orbital Hall effect. So for the uh, orbital Rajva uh, contribution, it's probably coming from the chiral orbital texture. So when you apply a current uh, along, for instance, longitudinal direction, and you shift the Fermi sphere, and you will get this kind of imbalanced, uh, you know, orbital angular momentum accumulation. That will give you a transfer, uh, transverse uh, orbital angular momentum current, and that's the reason why we call this orbital current. And it's also transverse to the longitudinal electrical current that you apply. And for the OHE or orbital hole effect, uh, it is probably related to the electric field driven 
hybridization between the orbitals, uh, for instance, the tangential components and the radial components of the orbitals, as stated uh, in this very nice uh, work by Go and co-workers back in 2018. So when again, when you apply a longitudinal current, you will see this kind of transverse imbalance of uh, or accumulation or uh, this kind of orbital angular momentum generation, and that can give you a transverse orbital current. So uh, a naive picture for this, or a simplified picture for this is that uh, a picture very similar to the spin hole effect that you apply a longitudinal current, for instance, along X direction, and then you generate this kind of orbital uh, current uh, along uh, Y direction, that, and that is the picture of the orbital hole effect. And in terms of the experiment, uh, uh, there's a very nice work uh, back in 2020. I believe this is uh, from uh, Professor Matthias Klaus' group. Uh, they show you that uh, if you have this typical, like a platinum ferry magnetic material by layer structure, but if you introduce an extra copper oxide uh, layer as a capping layer, uh, the, the overall damping light tori efficiency can be significantly enhanced uh, by using this copper oxide layer. So the data they show over here, uh, they use a hysteresis solution measurement to quantify this effect. I won't go into details because I'll talk about this a little bit later. Uh, they show you that uh, the damping light tori efficiency uh, from those samples with copper oxide capping uh, can be significantly enhanced, probably more than uh, a factor of 10, I believe. Uh, but without a copper oxide, if it's just platinum and the ferromagnetic material, you'll see this kind of very conventional spin diffusion trend uh, when you increase the platinum thickness. So uh, when the platinum thickness is about one point something nanometers, there's a peak uh, in terms of this damping light tori efficiency, which means that uh, only by introducing this light transition metal oxide layer, uh, the overall efficiency uh, is actually enhanced. Uh, and for the orbital hole effect, a uh, uh, similar effect can be uh, detected. But before going into that, I want to talk about how people actually uh, detect this kind of signal. For instance, uh, how the orbital current can generate this torque effect, and then uh, we can quantify uh, this, uh, the strength of this orbital, orbital hole contribution from us SOT uh, characterization. Uh, because we know that for orbital hole effect, uh, or orbital Rajpa other side effect, if you generate this kind of transverse orbital current, uh, the angular momentum, the orbital angular momentum actually cannot be absorbed uh, by the magnetization. Uh, only when you have a spin orbit coupling uh, inside the ferromagnetic layer uh, that is right, uh, adjacent to this normal metal layer, you can see this kind of uh, spin angular momentum transfer because you have to convert the orbital angular momentum to spin angular momentum first. And then the then can, you can have the exchange coupling and then can transfer uh, the angular momentum to the localized magnetic moment. So the steps of creating such orbital torque is that first of all, you have to generate the orbital current through either OHE or REE, and then the orbital current will be injected into the ferromagnetic layer and through the spin orbit coupling of the ferromagnetic layer, or in some later cases, we see that it's the spin orbit coupling in some other heavy metal layers. Uh, the, orbital angular momentum, or L, will be converted to S, or the spin angular momentum. In that case, then you can see this kind of uh, orbital torque effect. So if you, if you look at the past literature, you will see that uh, there are actually uh, many older works that actually already cited, uh, you know, stated this kind of orbital hole effect. For instance, in this uh, 2008 work, I think people who study spin hole effect uh, typically we cited this uh, first principle studies by Tanaka and co-workers uh, more than 10 years ago. Uh, they calculated the spin hole conductivity and the orbital hole conductivity of, of 4D and 5D transition metals. Although people, uh, if you remember uh, their results for spin hole conductivity, they, they show this kind of sign variation and the magnitude variation across this periodic table. And for 5D transition metal, uh, the tantalum and tungsten, they have negative sign of a spin hole conductivity. And for platinum and gold, they have positive sign. But if you look at the orbital hole, orbital hole conductivity, they, they are always having this positive sign. And the magnitude of it is actually, uh, uh, in some cases, comparable to the spin hole conductivity. And almost 10 years later, uh, this theoretical study also showed that uh, vanadium, chromium, manganese, uh, these materials, they actually will have uh, a, a orbital hole conductivity that are comparable to 
uh, other spin hole conductivity from the 5D transition metals, although their own spin hole conductivities are quite small as you can see over here. And they all have this kind of sign variations. So let us keep in mind that for the orbital conductivity, typically they all have this positive sign for all different materials. But for spin hole conductivity, you should be able to see this kind of sign variation as uh, we just saw in some earlier experimental uh, results. So more interestingly, from, uh, from, from this uh, experimental study last year, uh, they show that uh, if you use the same spin hole material or heavy metal material tantalum, but you couple that uh, with different kinds of ferromagnetic materials, you'll see this kind of sign change in terms of the, uh, the measure overall spin orbital efficiency. And then if you convert that to the uh, so-called spin hole conductivity, then you'll see this kind of sign change, which is pretty weird because we know that for tantalum, the spin hole conductivity should be negative. So uh, when you change the ferromagnetic material, you shouldn't change the sign. But over here, they see this kind of sign change and they attributed this to uh, the contribution uh, from the tantalum's you know, orbital hole conductivity. And because the orbital current has to be converted into spin current by the spin orbit coupling in the ferromagnetic layer, so by using different ferromagnetic layer, you should be able to see uh, like different uh, magnitudes of the, the second uh, of the second term. So it turns out that if you use, use nickel, uh, this conversion uh, coefficient uh, CFM is much larger. So you'll see this kind of sign change because uh, recall that for all 4D and 5D transition metal, all the orbital hole conductivities are positive. So that would tune the overall uh, you know, spin, I would say the spin orbital hole conductivity from negative to positive in the case of nickel tantalum. So this is a actually very interesting work. So this L to S interconversion coefficient as stated in this paper, uh, I think is a, a key to study uh, the orbital hole effect. And uh, also published uh, uh, last year is this uh, very interesting work on the switching. So uh, I won't go into details, but as you can see over here, they put a chromium under layer, uh, you know, uh, beneath uh, platinum. And we know that uh, platinum has a positive spin hole, spin hole angle and chromium has a negative spin hole angle. So uh, in the case that you have very thick chromium and a thin platinum and most of the current flowing in the chromium layer, uh, you should expect a negative uh, spin orbitor or a sign should be negative. But what they observe you know, on the right-hand side in the data show over here, when you increase the chromium thickness, they actually see an increase uh, of the uh, damping light tor efficiency or the spin hole angle uh, towards a more positive value, which suggests that when you increase the chromium layer, uh, you have more current flowing in the chromium. Uh, the sign of the, the overall spin hole conductivity or the spin orbital hole conductivity becomes more positive rather than becoming more negative. So that's uh, different from uh, our, uh, uh, intuitive thinking that a uh, chromium uh, as a negative spin hole angle. And when you increase the chromium thickness, you are having a more negative uh, spin hole angle. Uh, however, if you remove the platinum layer, uh, you will see that if you ha just have chromium, cobalt, boron, and indeed you have this kind of uh, expected decrease or you know, uh, you know, more negative uh, spin hole angle when you increase the chromium thickness. So this conversion can, uh, you know, not only from the uh, the ferromagnetic layer, but also can be achieved by uh, this uh, platinum layer, which is also a strong spin orbit coupling material. And uh, so if you recall this, uh, what I just mentioned earlier from Professor Marshall Lauri's uh, group, uh, they showed that using this copper oxide layer, you can enhance the, uh, the overall efficiency, but uh, only within a, 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 a very narrow, uh, there's a thickness of platinum. And that is because you need this platinum layer to perform this inter, uh, L2S or orbital to spin uh, interconversion. And so this is also consistent with the scenario that uh, the previous paper, uh, pr uh, the paper in the previous slide stated. So uh, what we did actually was uh, from a different approach. So we just do uh, like co-spottering and prepare alloy of platinum chromium. And at that time, when we collaborated with TSMC, we just wanted to see what kind of materials will be the best for uh, like getting large SOT efficiency. So we looked into different kinds of alloys, uh, platinum alloys or tungsten alloys. And it turns out that when we uh, incorporate chromium or vanadium, uh, or vanadium into platinum, uh, the enhancement is uh, much more significant than uh, doping other materials. And uh, the behavior seems to deviate from the intrinsic uh, spin hole mechanism. 
so the experiment, I'll go through the experiment uh, in, in more detail here. So the samples that we prepare are these kind of multi-layers with perpendicular anisotropy, and we pattern them into micron-sized hole bars. And as you can see over here on the right-hand side, uh, most of, I mean, I mean, within a suitable range of uh, doping chromium uh, into platinum, we can still have a perpendicular anisotropy that allows us to do some uh, classical, uh, you know, SOT keratization, such as harmonic measurements or uh, hysteresis loop shift measurements. And uh, for the chromium dope case, we have a wider range. Uh, sorry about the, uh, the notation here. This is platinum concentration. So uh, the, the uh, lower platinum concentration means that we have more chromium into the system. And the, for the chromium dope case, we have a wider range of uh, PMA, which allows us to do more, uh, you know, uh, component um, and dope dope and component concentration uh, dependent uh, measurements. And in order to characterize OT, we perform this uh, very, uh, you know, uh, commonly used hysteresis loop measurement that I proposed several years ago. And in this kind of measurement, we, we measured alloplane hysteresis loop shift uh, when we uh, apply different like polarities or different magnets of occurrence. And from that, we can extract this uh, outer plane effective field per current. And that is the sort of reincarnation of the SO damping line SOT acting upon the domain one moment or acting on this uh, cobalt uh, layer. And as we can see over here, when we uh, use uh, in-plane field to bias the sample, uh, when it is large enough to overcome the DMI uh, effective field, uh, the H over I, the outer plane field per current can reach a very large uh, number, which is about 30 or so per milliamp. Um, and if we want to uh, calculate the damping light core efficiency, of course, we have to include some other, uh, say, device dependent or geometry dependent parameters like the, the saturation magnetization of the cobalt layer or uh, the thickness excluding the dead layer and some the width of the hole bars and some other factors. So uh, from that, from these kind of data, we can estimate the damping light core efficiency of these uh, platinum chromium or platinum vanadium layers. And from this kind of heterostructure, as you can see over here, we summarize the result over here. When we increase the chromium content, we see this kind of enhancement of H over I. And um, for the vanadium case, because we have limited range of PMA, so uh, we only tested uh, three sets of samples, but we can see that, that this is very uh, consistent with the chromium results. And for platinum chromium case, uh, what's more surprising to us is that the damping light -like efficiency can reach uh, from the pure platinum case, which is about uh, 12, uh, sorry, 20% to almost close to 90%. And when we uh, presented this data to, uh, to, to um, uh, the com local community, they are all very surprised. And uh, to us, it's also a very surprise um, to myself. Uh, but uh, actually, uh, almost two years ago, uh, a group also uh, uh, published a very similar results by using a, uh, almost an identical uh, buffer layer structure, except that they have a platinum uh, insertion layer about 0.4 nanometers in between the buffer layer and the ferromagnetic kind of layer. And in that case, they, sh they only see this uh, a very slight enhancement uh, of the overall damping light -like torque or spin hole uh, efficiency, uh, unlike what we saw over here uh, from 20% to 90 or, or 80 or 90%. So uh, this is a, a, a very huge difference. Um, uh, probably depends on uh, how you prepare the sample uh, and the heat treatment. Uh, so here we summarize those uh, damping light -like efficiency from the samples with different composition, chromium dopants, uh, as a function of uh, resistivity, uh, because we know that uh, if this is effect is coming from the intrinsic mechanism, then the spin hole conductivity of the platinum should be a constant, and introducing chromium is just uh, enhancing the maybe more scattering and, and tuning the, uh, the, uh, the, the lifetime of the, the scattering. And that will just uh, enhance this damping light -like linearly. However, we see this kind of deviation uh, from the linear trend. So although the average uh, number or average number for the spin hole conductivity or the spin orbital hole conductivity is large, uh, we, we indeed see this kind of deviation from the linear trend. So alternatively, we plot uh, the spin hole conductivity uh, by using uh, this, uh, 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 our, uh, uh, experimental observed uh, or measure or determine damping light -like efficiency uh, times the uh, the uh, the longitudinal conductivity and then plot it 
as a function of uh, longitudinal connectivity. Uh, if it's really coming from an intrinsic mechanism, then we should see that uh, from the pure platinum case to uh, with a certain degree of do doping concentration, it should be a flat line because then the spin hole connectivity should be uh, the same. However, indeed, we see this kind of enhancement from about four times 10 to the fifth to about six or five uh, or six point something times 10 to the fifth uh, ohm meter inverse. So it means that the mechanism should be uh, different from just a, a intrinsic uh, mechanism and by uh, introducing more scattered. And so we believe that uh, a, a better explanation is that this uh, difference is coming from uh, the orbital hole uh, con uh, you know, contribution from the chromium and also by this interconversion uh, from the orbital hole or orbital current to spin current, uh, either by using the platinum layer uh, or by the cobalt layer. And so another uh, evidence or another uh, reason why we believe that this is the case is because uh, again, for chromium, the spin hole angle should be negative. So if you include more chromium into the system, you should be able to, if it's indeed coming from the spin hole effect, you should be able to see that uh, the effect should be uh, decreased instead of uh, being increased. And of course, we did some uh, switching measurement to verify that uh, indeed in the case of uh, chromium with chromium dopants, the critical switching current density or switching current can be reduced with preserving the thermal stability of the cobalt layer. And we also uh, calculate the power consumption. And indeed, when we increase the chromium contents, uh, there's a significant reduction of the power consumption. And if you consider a prototypic, a prototypic SOTM RAN device and then, uh, and then compare the results uh, with performing a benchmark uh, for different kinds of uh, published results, and indeed it's platinum chromium results is on the lower end you know, of, of all these data points. Uh, as you can see over here, for platinum-based uh, results, typically they have a very, very low uh, power consumption with uh, a moderately uh, low, uh, uh, let's say, the spin current source resistivity, which is uh, probably good for uh, industrial applications. And there are also other uh, people, uh, you know, reporting this kind of a benchmark, for instance, uh, Dr. Zhu from, or originally from Cornell University, had this very nice and comprehensive review uh, published last year. Uh, and they sh he showed you that indeed for the platinum case, uh, the, the damping light coefficiency can indeed approach uh, unity or uh, close to 100%. Uh, so not just the, uh, these kind of uh, charcoal genine materials can give you large damping light coefficiency, but also for the platinum based material system with some uh, for instance, in, their, in his case, he did some uh, interface spin transparency uh, engineering. And also from our industrial uh, uh, collab uh, partners, TSMC, they also perform this kind of benchmark and platinum-based alloys also lie you know, uh, at the lower end of uh, on this chart. Although you can see some outliers, like for instance, this is antimony, you can see this very, very low uh, writing or switching uh, power consumption but that will be prepared by a, a, a more complicated uh, method, MBE or exfoliant flakes. flakes. Uh, so I'm running out of time, so I'm going to, to speed up a little bit. Uh, so the, for the copper case, I'm just going to go through this very quickly. Uh, so not only by uh, co-spottering, we can also do this by uh, putting uh, a ca capping layer on top of the ferromagnetic layer and then to, to generate uh, the orbital hole current. And in this, in our case, we use copper or copper nitride. So by tuning the nitride composition, by tuning the flow rate of nitrogen during the reactive sputtering of copper uh, capping layer, we see these kind of significant enhancement of uh, damping light core efficiency uh, to more than uh, 30 or 40 percent uh, by just uh, tuning the nitrogen uh, components uh, in the copper layer. And if you compare to the uh, control sample case, there's a, a very significant enhancement of uh, the overall uh, spin orbital hole conductivity by using uh, a light 3D transition metal, uh, you know, um, you know uh, nitride. So this is similar to what uh, Professor Kyrie's group did uh, using this uh, copper oxide layer. So uh, here's my conclusion and I'll look. I believe that uh, I show you that the light 3D transition metal such as chromium vanadium or copper-based materials uh, can use this kind of spin orbit coupling free 
uh, you know, uh, mechanism to generate or to enhance the overall SOT efficiency or the spin orbital hull conductivity, but it typically relies on this, uh, you know, integration with this heavy metal or heavy or, or ferromagnetic material to to pro provide this orbital to spin interconversion. And we believe that further optimization, for instance, tuning the interface spin transparency using like anti ferromagnets nickel oxide, we can further improve this efficiency to maybe more than a 100%. So uh, with that, I want to thanks for your attention and see if you have any questions.